Hi, my name is Crystal King, and today you're going to learn about 10 interesting things that I've learned when I've been researching my historical fiction novels. And these are mostly about Italy and foods that were found through ancient Rome and the Italian Renaissance and forward. Number one is lemons. When I was writing my book, Feast of Sorrow, many people asked me why there weren't any lemons in the ancient Roman cooking that I described. And that's because lemons didn't really arrive in Italy until the second century. And they weren't actually ubiquitous in Italy until much later than that. Number two is about foie gras. And foie gras is something that I realize is totally controversial. I am just imparting what I learned about the history of foie gras. It turns out the French weren't actually the ones that really made foie gras in the first place. That might surprise some of you, but foie gras has been around since ancient Egyptian times when they would fatten up songbirds or cranes or flamingos, any kind of bird, it wasn't just geese, um, and they would fatten them up for their livers. In ancient Rome, this wealthy gourmand who I write about in my book, Feast of Sorrow, he, um, this guy Apicius, in his, the cookbook that is um, left, uh, his, his, basically it's his legacy, it's this cookbook with his name on it called Apicius. There is a method described that came from Apicius's kitchen that basically uh, fattens up pigs. And what he would do is he would fatten them up with dried figs and then he would get them drunk. And those dried figs would expand, thereby killing the pig, or if it didn't kill the pig, when they slaughtered the pig, the livers would be very fatty. Then it turns out we really didn't hear a lot about foie gras in dark ages and up until medieval times. And it turns out the Jews were the ones that were the, responsible for popularizing foie gras. And this might also be a surprise to some people who I think, because I think I'm not Jewish, so I can't speak for um, uh, the way that uh, kosher rules are, but it's not kosher today. But uh, that was something that had not been decided previously. In Jewish, um, in the Jewish areas of Rome, what they found is that they really needed uh, some sort of poultry product or poultry grease to uh, make their food with and they couldn't use butter and they couldn't use dairy and so they discovered that by um, fattening up geese that they were able to create um, a byproduct actually which was the liver they were they were keeping the geese primarily for um, the poultry fat the schmaltz uh, but they actually discovered that the livers were something that people wanted to have and Scopy, let me, I'm going to quote him. He noted in his 1570 cookbook that the liver of a domestic goose raised by the Jews is of extreme size and weighs between two and three pounds. And so there you have it. Uh, foie gras actually was popularized by the Jews and it spread from there throughout um, Europe. And then, of course, the French made it into what we know today. Number three, dormice. Dormice are a little mouse that actually lives in trees, essentially, and they're very common in all different parts of Europe, but the Romans loved them as food. And they actually would keep these dormice in what they called a gliarium. And this was a terracotta pot that had some ridges in it for them to run around and sit on. Um, but they would keep the pot closed with these little dormice in them so that they would get fat as they hibernated. And then they would actually um, fatten up the mice. After they fattened up the mice and, kill, and slaughtered them, they would stuff the mice and they would um, either roast them or they would fry them up, but they would always eat them with the bones whole. Not a delicacy we still eat today. Number four, macaroni first appeared in the 1400s and Maestro Martino, who was the chef to a uh, man in the Vatican, um, the Patriarch of Aquila, he had a cookbook that actually described how they would put pasta, they would put dough on the outside of uh, thin rods and lay them out into the sun 
and that's where we get the first macaroni. And then macaroni uh, it actually also makes an appearance in the 1570 cookbook for Bartolomeo Scopi. And after that, it became uh, something that we all know and love. Um, macaroni is probably one of the most popular pasta shapes today. Number five. Number five is silphium or, and laser. And this is an ancient herb that actually was something that went extinct uh, during the later part of the first century. And it was an herb that was cultivated for two reasons. First of all, they loved the taste of silphium. It was in absolutely everything, but it was also a powerful birth control. And so therefore, it was cultivated all over the Roman Empire by, for wealthy women to be able to use to control uh, the, the, the population, essentially. And uh, they, But they used it in all of their food but they didn't, couldn't figure out how to cultivate it. It was grown only in one place off the coast of Libya, um, or on the, on the coast of Libya actually, in an area called Cyrenica. And they couldn't figure out how to grow it anywhere else. It's like the modern huckleberry that only grows in the Pacific Northwest. They, they haven't figured out how to make it grow somewhere else. Um, and so what happened is that uh, silphium actually went extinct. And the person that was rumored to have had the last sprig of silphium was Emperor Nero, who probably had it as an oddity of some sort. And today though, we still have laser, which also existed in ancient Roman times. And um, let me also mention that silphium and laser was used in all of the food. It was like, it was just absolutely in all of the food. They loved the taste of it, it had the taste that was very similar to garlic. Garlic was used for medicinal purposes only, not to flavor their food. So to have this sort of garlicky flavoring in their food was um, something delicious to them. Laser, as I mentioned, still exists today, and we know it as asafetida, which is a, an herb, a resin, that actually um, is very common in Middle Eastern and Indian cooking. It's often called hing or devil's dung, and that's because it stinks to high heaven. But when you dry roast it or when you include it in dishes, it has this very subtle garlic flavor that the ancient Romans loved, and we do as well today. Number six, sugar. In the Renaissance, they loved sugar. They loved sugar more than we love sugar, if you can imagine that. It wasn't ubiquitous, however. Only the nobleman could actually afford it. And the wealthier you were, the more likely you were to be able to cook and uh, showcase your sugar that you were able to purchase. And so in the 1578 cookbook that Bartolomeo Scapi left behind called La Opera, the works of Bartolomeo Scapi, he has over a thousand recipes and 900 of them have sugar in them. They put sugar in everything. They put sugar in their lasagna. They put sugar in their pasta. They put in the pasta dough. They put sugar on fried eggs. Like the, it was in everything. Uh, but they also created these elaborate sugar sculptures. And these sugar sculptures could be in extraordinary shapes. Bartolomeo Scapi describes a couple of them in his cookbook, um, including an elephant with a castle on its back, Hercules wrenching the jaw of a lion, um, and a Moorish king astride a camel. I think there's also another one of a unicorn with its horn in the mouth of a lion. So the very elaborate sugar sculptures, and they wouldn't be white probably in this time frame at least. White sugar was available, but it wasn't easy to acquire. And so that was really maybe a century later when white sugar came in, but they, they had more um, different colors of sugars, but brown was probably the most prevalent. Um, and they would color the sugar. So all of these sugar statues that they would create would probably have been many vibrant colors from vegetable dyes. And you wouldn't have eaten them. They would have been rock hard. But the ability to create those sugar sculptures with this costly sugar showed how wealthy the nobleman was. One thing to note is that the sugar trade um, has been, has pr was pretty much born on the backs of slaves. And so that's one of the sordid histories of sugar's past. Um, too much for me to go into here, but something I just wanted to note. Number seven, turkeys. 
Turkeys were not something that were seen in Europe until about the early 1500s when Italian and Spanish explorers started to bring them over from Europe. And we see the first turkey recipes not until much later. That's because the Europeans thought the turkeys were gorgeous. They were beautiful animals. They kept them as pets. Nobility used to give them as gifts to their friends. And we don't see the first recipes for them until the 1570 cookbook by Bartolomeo Scappi. And that is really when we started to think about turkeys as a delicious meal. Number eight, the fork. The first depiction of a fork is actually found also in Bartolomeo Scappi's uh, 1570 cookbook. But forks actually have been around for a long time. They were probably um, originated in ancient uh, times in different parts of maybe Babylonia, uh, but they were very common in the Byzantine era particularly in the eastern part of the Roman Empire, so what we think of more as the Middle East now. But they weren't really common in Europe until the 1400s. And by the, the 1500s, they were, they were much more common, but we don't see the first depiction in, in any sort of form that uh, uh, in, in literature or writing or books until um, Bartolomeo Scappi's 1570 cookbook. Number nine, tomatoes. We think of tomatoes as this ubiquitous, um, it's in every single Italian dish. I mean, we can't have pizza without it. We can't have spaghetti without some tomato sauce. But tomatoes didn't actually find their way into Italian cooking until almost the 1800s. The first tomatoes we start to see were actually in the 1500s when they brought them over from the New World. Um, but there was a, um, a medical surgeon who declared that they were poisonous in one of his manuals of health that circulated in the 1500s. And that kind of killed the idea of whether or not you should eat a tomato for many centuries. Uh, they started to appear um, in the latter half of the 1600s and the 1700s. And the first tomato sauce recipe that we see is by a steward, um, a guy named Antonio Lantini, Latini. And he describes a tomato sauce that is more like a salsa. It includes like charring the tomatoes and the coals and then you peel them off, you chop them up and you put them together with onions and peppers and thyme. And there you have it. The first tomato sauce, which, took, uh, which was actually described in the 17th century. Number 10, sops. Sops is a dish that some of you, uh, if you were in the military or you had military parents here in the United States, you might be familiar with the idea of sops. There's a dish called shit on a shingle. And what that is, is a basically chipped beef on toast, or my mom used to make chipped tuna on toast. It's a beef or, or some sort of meat in a white sauce spread on toast. And it was economical, it was easy and fast to make, and so therefore it was actually served um, quite often in the military. Um, so that's where some of the people might be familiar with it. But the dish actually has its roots in the Renaissance and in medieval times where you would have uh, soupy dishes that you would soak up with toasted bread. And in fact, the word, and so the idea of soaking or sop, basically you would sop it up what that word comes from. The word supper also comes from sop, and so does the word soup. And in the 1570 cookbook by Bartolomeo Scappi, L'Opera, he has many recipes for sops. Most uh, very, uh, there was lots of savory dishes for sops and fruit dishes for sops, and they were meant for the sick because of course like a toasted bread with something soft on it would be easy to eat and easy to digest, and it would make you feel good when you were sick. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed these fun facts as much as I did when I discovered them during my research for my novels. And if you like what you heard today, please go ahead and subscribe and hit the like button and let me know what you think. I'd be delighted to hear what your impressions were of these Italian fun food facts um, before you heard um, what I had to offer today and what else you're interested in hearing about. Thanks for joining me and I will be seeing you soon. Ciao.